Many people think big data is everything. Well, I contend it is actually nothing. Many digital media producers nowadays are trying to create enhanced and meaningful digital experiences. And all the data gathered online and produced online is now just used for the quick win. Very few people in the industry actually question the value of what we're doing with data. And in the past few months, it has become my crusade to enlighten people about how we can use data in a more meaningful way. How we can use this online data, this super system of signs, in a more meaningful way is my goal. I'd like to give you a peek into my everyday thoughts. Because I believe that this fast-moving, participatory world we are currently living in, and the one we are creating online, are getting intertwined. Even more so, I believe that if we do not stop worrying about data and start studying and understanding semiotics, we could be pinching ourselves until our arms turn blue, and even then we'd have no clue of whether what we experience is real or not. I'd like all of us to understand the bigger picture of data. And not by learning how to code, but learning how to understand how this system, this super system of signs, can communicate with us in a more meaningful way. Just like Google already does, finishing our search questions. Daily, I work together with students and fellow researchers in creating and understanding virtual worlds that are able to transport our consciousness into a different world. Creating an experience that feels so real that even a virtual touch feels like a real one. And in that respect, I'd like to tell you something about the Oculus Rift film that we made last year called Diskinetic. A film in which the user determines what perspective and what view is going to be looked at. Offering them a 360 degree range of choices, of options. This is a picture from Go Short, International Short Film Festival in Nijmegen. And we had our premiere for our short film right here. We immersed our audience into experiencing a coma. For narrative purposes, of course, we made sure that you, as the coma patient, were able to hear and see your surroundings all interwoven with the story. When people stepped into our ambulance and wore the Oculus on their heads together with a headphone, they stepped into this dark world. A world in which your family is standing around your bedside wondering what to do with you in an eternal coma. The dilemma of decision-making is being played out and you are playing the lead role. At a certain point in the film, your sister touches your leg. Now, I have observed our so-called patients and found that many of them move their leg at the moment of virtual touch, just quickly ensuring for themselves that all of this is not real. I still am fascinated by how we make such understanding and create meaning from these virtual worlds. And I came to the conclusion that for myself to understand all of this, I needed to study semiotics. And people often ask me, what is semiotics? What are you actually researching? And the answer, to be honest, I don't know yet. But luckily, there's one large general agreement on what semiotics is. It is the science of signs, the study of meaning making. Stemming from linguistics, it has now grown into the fields of symbols, gestures, and expression of man and animal behavior. And now, it has found its way into the field of digital and virtual signification. And it are these two new fields that have a vast majority of unknown signs and symbols yet to define and identify. The title of my talk refers to the super system of signs the humongous database of letters, words, images, shapes, objects that is expanding with every new entry made by you and me, users of the digital and virtual environment. And in order not to leave you all too confused at the end of my talk, we'll take one leading example in our journey to understand why we need semiotics. For that, we'll use virtual reality as a means to understanding this complexity. Because I believe that virtual reality is something we all have some sort of an idea with. From films like Tron and The Matrix, we've already played with the idea of a possible second virtual world existing besides our own. Already since the 50s, mankind has played around with the idea of a parallel world. 
Now, the interesting thing here is that this thinking of a parallel world brings us to the concern many people have. We do not need a reality to experience something that feels real. But then, what is real? Can I still trust myself in identifying this real world from a virtual one that might look and feel exactly the same? And there are two very interesting theories that have been developed over time when it comes to virtual reality that I'd like to share. And the first scholar I'd like to mention here is Nick Bostrom. He claimed in his simulation argument that there is one truth when it comes to virtual reality. The time will have to show up. And totally says there are three possibilities. Either we will never reach the stage in which technology can simulate a world that looks and feels just as real as this one. Or, second, he says, we will reach that advanced technology, but we will never use it because of the dangers it might hold. Or third, when the two former options are both proven false in time, then we are most definitely, most definitely already in a virtual world right now. The second scholar I'd like to mention here is Jean Baudrillard. He's the founder of the notion simulacra and simulation, describing the simulacra as never that which conceals the truth, it is the truth which conceals that there is none. The simulacra, therefore, is true. So, I'll explain this a little bit. According to Baudrillard, we've already started to replace meaning with signs and symbols, resulting in the human experience being a simulation of reality. Let me give you an example. We can all imagine how it would be like to sit inside a crashing plane, even though we all never had the actual experience. This simulation in symbols and signs has made us believe that this is truth. What has happened is that we've ceased to understand the larger picture of this all, the larger picture of data. But what went wrong in this fight for data? Why are so many online services failing to cater to our needs of interpretation with the digital system? And that is because we've ceased to understand the meta-narrative of it all. And the meta-narrative looks a little bit like this. And let me explain the meta-narrative and this model behind me. And maybe best for that is if I use media products and ethics, something we're all familiar with. So imagine all these small blocks being a media product, a television series, a book, a game, a film, because there are many media producers out there and all of them create different stories on different platforms. But all of them have an understanding of the general agreement on specific shared ethical values, a meta-narrative. Without them understanding this meta-narrative, they're unable to create satisfying media products for us, the audience. Another example is digital media, because the same goes for digital media. Imagine those blocks not being media products, but imagine them being applications you use on your phone or your tablet. Many of them are using the data now just for a quick win, unable to understand our communication with the system, unable to understand the meta-narrative and the connections that can be made. An example of this, last week I went to see a theater performance with a friend of mine. And we did not really know what to expect, but we had some high hopes. And my friend took a picture of the performance's poster, posted it on Facebook, and said, looking forward. Now, immediately, the Facebook algorithm went to search for similar performances that they could advertise to him. However, when after the first act, we found that we did not like the performance at all, and left, actually, he commented on his Facebook that he did not like it. Now, what should the algorithm read at this point? And I think there are two very important steps that can be taken in between. First is that we have to make sure that we create a system that is able to not only read the text on the poster, but also the visuals. And therefore, it is able to dissect genre, style, place of performance, and link that to the other data. Second is that we have to create a system which can understand that this person did not like the performance at all, and realizing as a system that it might be smart not to advertise similar performances anymore. 
You see, these are a few of the reasons why I think that we are in need of a digital semiotic system to really get a hold and an understanding of this meta-narrative to its full extent, something we still have a journey to walk to. Because all the data and text we are creating online is dynamic. And that means that it can change any time into anything the user desires. If I perform a Google search, I can get text to become image all of a sudden, or even audiovisual content. And the problem will be if that I create a system that is only responding to specific input characteristics. If it can only respond to text, it doesn't know what to do with my image. It will never completely understand me as a user, let alone being able to create something far more important than just that, which is a valuable discourse with me, the user. See, the problem is, and that is also my crusade, is that we're now teaching people just to use data. We're teaching them how to code. And instead, I believe that we should teach them an understanding of how this super system of science is able to talk to us, make sense for us, the users. I think it is time that we teach and understand and study semiotics, digital semiotics, and understand the meta-narrative of data. Thank you.